we pay the most attention to what we're doing when the challenge of the task at hand slightly, slightly is the key, exceeds our skill level. So you definitely want to stretch. You are outside your comfort zone, right? But you don't want to snap. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take, what does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again, breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. What do you think a few practical changes people could make would be um, to, to find flow states more regularly or in, in different, con more conventional settings? We've got 150 years of psychology, 25 years of neurobiology, right? Physiology, what's going on in the body, it's kind of a black hole. Like the measurement technology we need to start looking at it is showing up right now as we talk, right? That said, what we do know, to answer your question, is that flow states have triggers. Right now, we know of about 18 different triggers. These are preconditions that lead to more flow, right? And the, the first thing that you need to know is the most obvious. Flow is about attention. Flow can only take place when all of your attention, all of your focus is completely in the present moment, in the, in the now, is to, to use that horrible phrase. But, right, horrible phrase, but we gotta use it, it's true. These triggers, if you strip everything else away, they're focusing techniques. They're all the ways that evolution shaped our brain to pay attention to the present moment, right? So they're deeply hardwired in all of us. And we know flow is ubiquitous, so it can show up anywhere, in anyone, provided certain initial conditions are met. The reason action and adventure sport athletes are so important to this discussion is because they gave us a data set with which to work. We actually could say, okay, these guys have to be in flow to throw those double back flips. So we know, we don't have to wonder if they're in flow and we can work backwards and it's led us to these triggers. These triggers though, can be applied anywhere. Let me give you a simple example and kind of map it from one world to the other. The most obvious thing you think about when you think about action and adventure sport athletes is the massive amount of risk they're taking, right? Risk. It's a focusing mechanism. It's an amazing focusing mechanism, literally under the hood. Whenever we take a risk, the brain releases dopamine, which is a primary focusing chemical. It drives attention into the now, right? It's also a big reward drug. It does a bunch of other things, but focuses our attention. Same thing with norepinephrine, which also gets released whenever we take a risk. Here's the cool part. You don't have to take a physical risk. The, you can take an emotional risk, a creative risk, a social risk. In fact, your brain can't tell the difference between social risk and physical risk. Same brain structures process them. It sounds kind of puzzling, right? Like why the hell would that be? Think about it. You go back 200, 300 years and you screwed up socially, right? You got banished, exiled. You didn't live. It was a capital crime. It was capital punishment. Nobody could live apart from the tribe. So the brain, because it's very old and it's been doing this a long time, processes physical pain and physical risk in the same place it processes social pain and social risk. So you, can, so you can swap these things out. You need risk, but it doesn't have to be physical and it's totally proportional. So Laird Hamilton has to paddle into a 50 foot wave at Jaws to pull this trigger. But the shy guy has to raise his hand in the business meeting and just speak up with this great new idea, right? It is totally proportional. Now, at an organizational level, though, so this tells us something really interesting. It says that organizations that rely on rapid experimentation, trying things out, trying things out, trying things out. And Jeff Bezos has a great quote we talked about in bold, where he says, the success of Amazon is directly proportional to the number of experiments we run per year, per month, per week, right? But if you're going to run these wild experiments, you have to take lots of risks and you're going to fail. So you need that fail forward Silicon Valley attitude here if you're running that kind of organization. If you're not, it's just your own life. You still need it in your own life because if you take lots of risks, 
you're going to fail over and over and over again, and you're going to have to deal with that. But the upside is you're going to have much greater access to flow as a result, and performance, productivity, motivation, creativity, all the things you get are going to come online more frequently. Now, this is only one of 17 triggers. So if you don't, risk is not your thing, right? There's plenty of other gateways in. In fact, just to do this, creativity. When we make connections between ideas, the brain also releases dopamine. And you've had this experience. You've filled out a cross repository, get an answer right, get that little rush of pleasure and focus, that's dopamine, right? Whenever we link ideas together creatively, pattern recognition, you get more dopamine. There are ways to create conditions for pattern recognition in the brain. It triggers more flow. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to take the physical risks or social or spiritual or whatever, fine, go over here, try creativity. Lots of different ways in. That's fascinating. I actually really want to want to uh, sit on that risk as a factor for a second because that's really interesting. Would you say risk could be you could say synonymous with fear, like using that as a compass for where your risk areas are in your life? Well, I've said I said this in I've said this in Rise, and, I, and I've said this before. For me, what I one of the things I've gained from this is that to me, I'm a very fearful guy. I. I, I know that sounds very strange because I do these action sports. I spend a lot of time public speaking. I do all these things that scare people. I have a lot of fear. The only difference with me is that I discovered very early on in my life that if I go straight at the thing that I'm afraid of, there's amazing success on the other side. That's where the greatest joy, that's where the greatest reward and the most flow is. So personally, when I get really nervous and uncomfortable and scared, I go, okay, I don't like how this feels but suck it up because I'm going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I literally use fear as a way to steer by. And I'm, you know, I'm always saying to my teams, no matter what the project is, be flow genome project stuff, it could be people working you know, with me on my books and whatever, my common question is, are we going big enough? Is there an idea we haven't thought of that we haven't tried? You know, what's the craziest thing we can do here? What's the most risk we can take? You know, where does it get really, really scary? Because those things lead in really interesting directions. And if you're interested in ultimate performance, if you're interested in world-changing tasks like we talk about in bold, right, changing the world for the better, that kind of stuff, you're going to need to learn to love risk. Ariana Huffington talks about risk as a muscle, and she's absolutely right, right? You've got to practice it over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, and I like you know what you said about well, risk is very perceptual. It's very specific to the individual's perceptions of what risk means. And like you said, you can either throw a double backflip, or risk for someone might be to walk across the bar and talk to the girl. So it's it's highly specific to you know like the personal growth areas of the individual. And you know when people talk about like living life at its highest potential, I always wanted to dig deeper. Like what what are you actually saying by that? And I I. I, I've come to kind of think of that as like, are you operating at the fringes of your abilities? Are you kind of working at that perimeter of where your abilities are? And when you hit that, you, you know you're at the perimeter when you have fear. Because fear is kind of that recognition of, I don't know what's, what's going to result from this. I'm not sure. I don't feel comfortable. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, it seems like a flow state is kind of this like reward for experiencing, you know, the expanded edge of your potential. You're absolutely correct in a lot of different ways. Let, let's start kind of on the beginning. The most famous flow trigger at all, of all is, an, is a psychological trigger known as the challenge skills ratio. What this means is we pay the most attention to what we're doing when the challenge the task at hand slightly, slightly is the key, exceeds our skill level. So you definitely want to stretch. You are outside your comfort zone, right? But you don't want to snap. If you push too far, and we see this, by the way, peak performers, high performers make this mistake all the time. If you're wired like me, you will take on tasks that are 30% greater than your skill set, 40% greater, 50% just because you're wired that way. And the truth of the matter is you actually got to go for slightly smaller challenges. And the secret isn't the big, big risk leap, right? It's a little bit every day, but you have to commit to it every day and every day and every day. And you're right, flow is sort of the reward for pushing outside your comfort zone and for when you get to level up, right? When a flow state shows up, it means that all those skills you were trying to learn, whatever, they've come together, right? They've come together and you're getting these emergent properties, these elevated properties as a result. 
but it's it's absolutely the payoff and it's a real payoff right flow is incredibly intrinsically motivating people talk about it as the source code of intrinsic motivation so once an experience starts producing flow you go really far out of your way to get more of it yeah and so so taking that realization of, of it's four percent right you know r- roughly that's what they've discovered is like four percent outside of your your abilities however the hell you measure that I don't that, know okay I, and I have to say that was a that, <laughs> That number and we're really cautious of that number. <laughs> Back at the envelope calculation between Mihai Chiksent Mihai, so the godfather of flow psychology, and a Google mathematician. And they, they said, God, we think it's a 4% difference. Okay. We said, What the hell is that? That doesn't make any sense, but it's interesting. So, what I literally did is I mapped the place I ski and the place I mountain bike and where I was as a rider, where I was as a skier, and how difficult every obstacle, you know, whatever. And I tried just to push 4% mm-hmm. over the of a season let just see does this work right and what i discovered is two things first of all i didn't plateau you normally in a, in a season i would a couple flow states early on things get exciting and i plateau my skills plateau until the very end of the season i didn't plateau i kept advancing kept advancing kept advancing and the same thing happened in ski season the next year i said okay that was crazy i tried it i had a bunch of friends try it and we ran a loose experiment it worked for them as well. So that number is so unvalidated. It's, you know, it's not even, shouldn't even be talking about it out loud. And where it is, is is hard to find, of course, and it's totally individual, but I do think it's kind of accurate. I just, I wish we could quantify it better. Yeah, and so, okay, so when you're on the mountain, you kind of looked for, oh, the, you know, this looks maybe 10 feet bigger of a drop than I'm used to, which is about maybe 5% more. It's- I used, I used a combination of my own fear level. How much did this thing scare me? From like where I am now, I said, okay, here's a 10 foot road gap. Here's a five foot tabletop jump. Well, the five foot tabletop jump, totally my skill set, sweet spot. The 10 foot road gap, that scares me too much. So 4% <laughs> is probably right in the middle. And let's find a seven foot road gap or something. Yeah. That thing, totally loose, totally informal. But the good thing about especially downhill mountain biking is because they're fixed obstacles. They don't move. I know, you know, on Monday, if I jump a five foot gap, it's five feet on Tuesday as well. Right. Yeah. So it allowed me to kind of stay in like 4%. I could actually do it mathematically a little. So again, not rigorous, but the effects I got were so astounding. And so in two seasons doing this, I think I progressed as much as I did the previous 10 years as an athlete. I've never seen anything like it. Right mm-hmm. now, I have tried very hard to apply those same things in my writing as a creative. Right, this is flow. It's nice. The action sport athletes, athletic stuff is fun. My business is writing. I got to put words together in a straight line every day, no matter what. Right, so creativity requires a lot of flow. All this stuff. So I found that four percent for me, that sweet spot is. I feel like I'm being a little too honest. Like I'm showing you a little bit too much of myself in my writing. And I'm laying out an oh, and or I'm laying out an idea for the first, you know, in public that is a little farther than I've ever, you know, pushed my ideas before in public and talk about it. So like a little bit uncomfortable. When I'm a little bit uncomfortable, I know my writing is in that sweet spot. So, mm-hmm. you know, these it's hard to apply, it's very individual, and you have to conduct the experiment. We we'll say this at the Flow Genome Project over and over and over again. Nobody can do your push-ups for you. You have to conduct the experiment, right? Yeah. So would you would you say, you know, if someone was trying to discover, okay, where are my 4% areas? Could, you know, if I think about it like, does it scare me? Okay, and how would I rate my fear on a scale of 1 through 100? If it's in that first 10%, would you say that would be a, a decent list, litmus test for, okay, it's a little outside of my... Well, it's on a scale of 1 to 10, if yeah. it's in the first, right? In there, if on a scale of 1 to 100, it would be in the first 40%. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. Factor okay. it up. So, yeah, because I think what you just brought up, that connection to writing, you know, how you identify it in writing, having, having people look and examine in their life and, you know, where are the areas that, that I have, have fear and, and is there a growth potential in that area? And am I in that, that 40th, you know, four, or four out of 10 scale of fear with it? That's, that could be a potential flow trigger for me if I engaged in that activity. For sure. I mean, you 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 want to add in risk. You want to add in challenge, skills, balance. You want to, you know, if you read Rise of Superman, um, which is the book I wrote on all this, they're all kind of broken out. Mm-hmm. And we know, by the way, nature nurture reasons. A lot of this has to do with genetics, and there's nothing you can do about it. Different people are susceptible to different triggers, 
Mm. Right? Let me give you an example. There's an altruism-based flow state known as Helper's High. It was discovered by Alan Lukes, who founded Big Brother His Big Sister. It literally, the gateway into Helper's High is through helping others. We don't actually, we think it's because with the other people and other people's needs there, it focuses attention, it does a bunch of things. We think it's woven in with the social triggers. We don't really understand it, but usually people who love the altruism-based stuff don't love risk, I've discovered. It tends to be either or. One way or the other, I don't know why that is, but like a lot of it just seems to work that way. Mm -hmm. It's different pings for different people. A lot of it has to do with dopamine receptors and neurochemistry and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And we don't totally understand it at all. But you, what you need to do is experiment kind of with all of them. You certainly want two or three or four of them in combination to really kick you into flow. Um, more, the more the merrier. You don't have to try to, there's no way to layer on the 17 because. Seven of them or eight of them are, are, are about individual flow and 10 of them are for triggering group flow, the shared collective version of this experience. Um, there's some overlap, but the, the group flow triggers aren't going to work for producing individual flow and vice versa. Awesome. And, and so when we're, you're, you're thinking about, you know, you said this is in its infancy, this, the research into flow. What do you think are the key questions right now that research could seek to answer that would give us a better understanding of how we can consciously replicate these states for broader demographics or, or help identify if, if altruism is your trigger or if, you know, risk is your highest, most, you know, your, your biggest so impact I, trigger. The easiest way to answer that is to tell you what we're doing in the flow genome, which the first step is right now, if I want to know you're in a flow state, the only established scientific method is to give you a, a questionnaire, a survey, right? It's extremely well validated. There's 50 years of research and testing. It's kind of probably one of the most well validated questionnaires in all of science. We know it, it's solid. It's still subjective, right? And it doesn't give us in the moment data, right? Like if I want to compare the flow you get into it as a musician playing in a band versus the flow a football player gets on a field versus the flow public speaker gets versus somebody coding software, right? Those would be interesting comparisons. I can't do it other than wait for the experience to pass and give you this questionnaire. We want a biophysical based flow detector. And what's cool about that is sensors and networks, smart health, biotechnology, all these things are accelerating exponentially right now. So, when I started writing Rise of Superman, by the way, I thought a biophysical based flow detector, something that could, you know, look at everything from microphrasal expressions to pupil dilation to brain waves to blood chemistry, all that. I thought we were at least 10 years out. I think it could be done within a year, two years. Like technology is moving so fast. Um, so for me, the, that's the first step. Once we can, you know, say, okay, this person is in a low grade micro flow state, this is a macro flow state. We can really start building what we call the heat map for flow. Heat map for flow is literally like if you're this kind of person, this is the easy, this is your access to flow. These are the things. And by the way, we have a crew version of that. If you go to the Flow Genome Project website, right, there's a free uh, flow profile on there that anybody can take. And it says, you know, based on this information, these are the areas in your life you're most likely to find flow. Do more of these things. So we're already at the front end of that. We want to make that as rigorous and scientific as possible. And we want to bring this to scale, right? We want as the biggest data set we can possibly get. Yeah, that's really exciting to see what's going to be coming out along those lines. And, you know, especially with like the risk, the, you know, risk and pushing that 4%. I'm wondering if you could, you know, there must be a way to have some kind of biophysiological measure of a fear response. Right. And then you could you could potentially hypothetically put that on a snowboarder as they're going and see right before they do something. What was that fear? You know, what scale did it push to? Was it in that fourth percentile? Are you guys looking at stuff like that with regards to studying particularly risk? And well, yeah, I mean, we'll take it one step back. Right. We want to we're interested at the front end of the flow state. You get all the stress hormones. So there's cortisol, there's norepinephrine, there's adrenaline. Right. What level that gets to is essentially how much fear you're feeling. Mm. So we definitely want that kind of data. In fact, this is kind of cool. Norep, it's very hard to measure neurochemicals. Right. I can't put a sensor in your brain. But it turns out that norepinephrine, principal anxiety, fear chemical, Pupil dilation correlates directly to it. So we can use a Wi-Fi connect sensor built into kind of a goggles, like ski goggles or something like that, 
to measure pupil dilation, and it should, hypothetically, we're still working on this, correlate with fear response. That is fascinating. Awesome. Okay, so sh shifting a little bit, um, if we consider, which is, this is one of my favorite uh, lines in your talk, and you know when you reference the McKinsey study, uh, it talks about how C CEOs were 500% more productive in flow states, and you know making the the illusion that that you could you could come in on Monday and get one day's worth of work done in flow and be done for the week and get as much done as as other people who are in a steady state. Um, 